So we're now in our third month of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Why hasn't Ukraine tried to blow up the Crimea Bridge? Now, the Crimean Bridge sits over the Straits of Kirsch, and it connects Russia with Crimea. This is a pretty important choke point between Russia and its bases in Crimea, so why hasn't Ukraine just taken it out? Well, the answer to that touches on everything from the Mongol invasion to America's war in Vietnam. But stay with me. I'm going to walk you through it. So first, I got to talk about Crimea and why it's so important. So if you ever take a look at a map of Ukraine, you'll see this landmass down here. This is Crimea. It's roughly the size of Massachusetts, and it's of immense strategic importance because Crimea controls access between the Sea of Azov and the Black Sea. You got Ukraine on one side and you got Russia on the other. If you control Crimea, you dominate the Black Sea. This strategic importance has resonated throughout the ages. Crimea has been invaded by a lot of empires. Crimea was the last stronghold of the Mongol army, and then it was held by the Crimean Tartars, and then it was held by the Russian Empire. The British, French, and Ottomans tried to capture Crimea during the 1800s, and then the Germans tried to capture Crimea during World War II. Now, Crimea was part of Ukraine when the Soviet Union fell in 1991 but there was still a significant Russian-speaking and ethnically Russian presence on Crimea when that happened. And Crimea also contained the highly strategic Sevastopol naval base, which was the headquarters of the former Soviet Black Sea Fleet. Now, Russia had leased this base from Ukraine after the fall of the Soviet Union, and it worked out fine until... 2014 came along. You see, back in 2014, Ukraine was an absolute chaos after Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych, who was pretty close to Russia, was ousted from government. President Vladimir Putin of Russia decided to take advantage of this situation and send troops into Ukraine, only these troops had no insignia, no markings. In fact, they were dubbed little green men by the press. These soldiers took over Crimea slowly over the course of a month, and Ukraine just didn't have the ability to fight back. And when this happened, this was crazy. It would be like Canada annexing Michigan and America being too poor, corrupt, and preoccupied with internal politics to do anything about it. And now we come to the bridge. A few months after Russia annexed Crimea, they started planning the bridge. This bridge would have two rail tracks and four road lanes, and it would allow someone in Moscow to vacation in Crimea in just 33 hours on the train. The bridge was completed in 2019, and it pretty much sealed the deal that Russia was never giving up Crimea. This bridge is of immense strategic value, and Russia is definitely using it to bring troops and supplies into Crimea that go forward into Ukraine. Okay, so Crimea is important. The bridge is important. The Russians are using the bridge to funnel troops and supplies. Why hasn't Ukraine taken out that bridge? Well, here's the deal with bridges. Human beings have been building bridges since at least the 13th century BC, and we are pretty darn good at it. I mean, the whole point of a bridge is that you engineer it so it doesn't fall down. You take a look at the caravan bridge in Turkey. That thing's been up since the year 850. As a species, we really tend to overbuild these things. So that's kind of problem number one. And as much as we'd like to believe that we could get some kind of special forces team in there that could sneak behind enemy lines and plant a couple of bombs that could drop the span. Look at this thing. The width of the rail bridge is 15 yards. The width of the road bridge is 27 yards. You're not dropping this with a brick of C4. This controlled detonation in Germany took 256 pounds of explosives to collapse the bridge. A special forces team is not humping in 256 pounds of explosives. Okay, so what if we bomb the bridge? Well, that kind of has its own problems. The Kerch Strait is known for bad weather and windy conditions, but let's say it's a nice day, the perfect day for bombing. Okay, quick explanation on parts of a bridge. These things sticking up out of the water are called piers. This thing here is the superstructure, and the length between these two piers is called a span. 
Our mission is to collapse this span, at least one. Well, technically two, because we have to collapse the road bridge and the rail bridge in order for this to be effective. Now, in order to increase our chances of a hit, we can't fly perpendicular to the bridge. We have to fly straight down the road. Okay, now if you were gonna defend a bridge, where would you put the air defenses? Yeah, me too. So you're trying to hit something that's a quarter the size of a football field while you're traveling 500 miles an hour and people are shooting at you. Good luck. Look, man, if a bridge is important enough to bomb, it's important enough to defend really, really well. Now, I know what you're thinking. Ryan, why don't they just use a laser guided bomb? Then it's fry me a sailor. I'll be back for breakfast. But let's talk about the size of this bomb. And now we get to talk about Vietnam and the Tan Hoa Bridge. This is the town of Tan Hoa, Vietnam. And this is the Tan Hoa Bridge, over which all sorts of supplies went from North Vietnam all the way down to South Vietnam. Take out the bridge and you stop the flow of munitions into South Vietnam. Easy as pie. Now in 1964, which was pretty much the start of the escalation in Vietnam, a list of targets was drawn up that the United States could attack, which would significantly degrade North Vietnam's ability to carry the fight in the South. The Tan Hoa Bridge was one of those 94 targets. On April 3rd, 1965, roughly 80 fighters, bombers, tankers, and recon aircraft lifted off to take out that bridge. The main strike package included 30 F-105 Thunder Chiefs loaded with 750 pound bombs and these new AGM-12 bullpup smart missiles. Note that these bullpup smart missiles really weren't that smart. They just had a flare in the back of the missile and the pilot could guide it down to the target using radio signals. And the missile only had a 250 pound warhead, which isn't a lot to take out a bridge. Oh, and as an added bonus, you can only fire one missile at a time. You have to guide it manually while flying the plane and people are shooting at you. 120 bombs hit that bridge. Two aircraft were destroyed, but the bridge was mostly undamaged. So the next day, the Air Force ordered a second strike. This time, 300 bombs hit the bridge. Two more aircraft were shot down, but the bridge still stood. But the Air Force and then later the Navy kept trying with different tactics, but nothing they did could drop that bridge. It wasn't until April of 1972 that the Air Force, with very large laser-guided and TV-guided weapons, finally dropped a single span of that bridge. It took the world's strongest military seven years, 871 sorties, and 11 lost aircraft to take out a single bridge. Okay, so back to present day and the Crimea Bridge. There were more aircraft on the initial Tan Hoa raid than are remaining in Ukraine's Air Force, which should be about 56 or so planes. Now, it's reasonable to assume that Ukraine, even with Soviet-era upgrades, is probably still at a 1960s, 1970s level of technology when it comes to bombing. So I don't think an airstrike is a good option. What if we send a missile? Now, Ukraine does have short-range ballistic missiles, but the range on those weapons are about 115 miles. So even if they were close enough, ballistic missiles follow a very predictable ballistic path, and the Russians will be able to intercept those warheads. And even if they didn't shoot them down, the accuracy of that warhead is about 150 meters. So remember, you're trying to hit something a third the size of a football field, and accuracy 150 meters is probably not going to do it. Now you might say, well, why don't you send one of those Barakhtar drones with the micro-missiles? But these micro-missiles don't have a very large warhead. Okay, so what if Ukraine uses one of those Neptune anti-ship missiles? But then you'd have to reprogram the missile, and still then it only has a 330-pound warhead, and that's not that much bigger than those bullpup missiles had in Vietnam, and they didn't do anything. But what if it's more advantageous to actually keep the bridge up? Now think about this. 
every time a train goes by that bridge, intelligence can be gathered on what equipment that train is carrying. And if that bridge is in the water, it doesn't have to be defended anymore. So by keeping the bridge up, the Russians are taking very expensive anti-aircraft equipment and keeping them away from the fight to defend a bridge that's never going to be attacked. And there is one more thing. Maybe the Ukrainians want that bridge to stay up because it's a means of escape. Look, if there's one thing the Ukrainians have proven themselves good at, it's shaping operations. These are operations that shape the battlefield in order to create conditions for victory. Maybe Ukraine is shaping a long-term plan to actually take back Crimea. And as ancient general and philosopher Sun Tzu once said, give your enemy a golden bridge to retreat across. Thank you for watching.